Hi there! This video is about learning assumptions behind interactive spatial learning theory. Incidentally, you may hear bird sounds in the background because I'm near a window and it's still springtime. Interactive spatial learning theory, or ISL, is based on several theories of learning, theories of motivation, and on my research in online and in-person formal and informal learning spaces from the last eight years. Now all theories are based on a set of assumptions, in this video and the next, I'm going to talk about the set of assumptions behind ISL. Here's the first assumption. We construct new knowledge by building on foundational background knowledge and previous experience. What this means is that people are not blank slates. In fact, even the students in your classroom probably know a little bit about the topic you want to teach. Now, not only that, but everyone's way of knowing and creating knowledge are different. Why? Because everybody's foundational background knowledge and previous experiences are different. Here's what I mean by that. Let's say, for example, there are two people taking a history class in college. One person is taking the course because they want to be a historian, and the course is crucial to what they want to study when they go to grad school. The other person is taking the course because they're a business major, and this is the very last class they need in order to graduate with their degree. As you can imagine, the material taught in the class is identical, but each person is learning and doing very different things with the information presented in class. The understandings that each person takes out of the class is dependent upon what their prior experiences are, who they are, and how they plan to use the information that they've learned. Now think back to the classes you took in college and compare yourself to your classmates, and you'll understand what I mean. No one learns the same exact thing even though the same information is taught by the same teacher. In other words, what gets learned is always individualized. Here's the second assumption. Everything is learned in context. What I mean by context is I'm talking about the setting, environment, and or situation where the knowledge and information are embedded. Context affects how things are learned and how people interpret and make meaning of the information. To demonstrate what I mean, let me tell you the story of Billy the Kid. When Billy was four years old, both his parents were already dead. His guardian put him on a train to send him to a new home in the country. Now, young Billy couldn't read or write, nor could he remember his address. So, of course, his guardian wrote Billy's name on a tag and secured it around Billy's neck with a string. However, despite the best efforts of the railroad staff, Billy never arrived at his new home. So I'm going to pause here because some of you are probably going, oh my gosh, what horrible thing happened to such a young kid? But it's not as bad as you think. Now, first of all, this is a great activity to teach kids how to ask questions, which is, incidentally, one of the science and engineering practices. I have a book of lateral thinking puzzles similar to this one, where you present a story, then ask your students what happened or why. Their job is to ask questions of me that I can answer with a yes or no to try and figure out the situation. In other words, they're learning how to ask investigative questions to figure out the context of the puzzle. Now, the puzzle about Billy is like this. And I'm sure some of you are thinking that Billy didn't arrive home because something horrible happened to him, like he got kidnapped or something. You may also wonder how the railroad staff could have been so careless about taking care of a little kid, right? And you're probably feeling very sorry for little four-year-old Billy who was orphaned. Here's where context matters. Billy is a kid, but there's two meanings for a kid. It means a young human, or it could mean a young goat. Ah. Makes sense? Billy is a goat, and the reason he couldn't arrive at his new home is because he ate the tag that had all his information. So do you see what I mean by context completely changes the meaning of the story? And that context is based on the interpretation of a single word, kid. I bring up this point because when I started truly implementing inquiry-based learning, where I could identify students' misconceptions from the very start of an investigation, it turns out that students can get hung up on the misinterpretation of your words. Whether it's understanding the definition of them or understanding your meaning or intent behind them, context can change an entire lesson. And that's the reason why I want to give you this next example with a clip from an old version of The Lion King that demonstrates how music 
can change one's interpretation of the scene. This is the same scene in both incidences, but notice how the change in music makes you feel. Girl, you just don't realize what you do to me when you hold me in your arms so tight. You let me know everything's all right. So for most people, the first scene is kind of a, a joyous, happy feeling. And in the second scene, it probably feels really ominous in a certain way. Okay, so I want to connect this to talk about math and science anxiety. When you say, I'm not a math person, or I'm not good at math, or I'm not a science person, or I'm not good at science in front of your students, it gives this unwritten implication that some people are gifted in math and others will never be gifted in math or science. It's kind of like playing that ominous music behind the scene. This is really contradictory to the growth mindset that many schools and teachers are trying to give to their students, meaning that talent and skills are acquired through hard work and they aren't fixed traits. Your attitude and expectations of yourself and your students is like the music in a movie scene. It sets the tone for how your students feel and how they will perform. When it comes to science, if you're expecting your students to be and act like scientists, then you should expect your students to be and act like scientists. It's amazing how much an expectation can actually change how your students behave in the class. I'm going to stop here at these two assumptions because the next video on the self-directed learning assumption is a little longer. Besides which, this is a good place to stop and reflect. So here are the questions for this section. What are your expectations of your students when they are doing science? What does your classroom look like when kids are doing science? What are your students doing? What are your students saying? And what are you saying? So this piece is about these expectations. And then, how will you know about your students' interpretations and misinterpretations of your lesson? That's it for now, so see you in the next video.